Standard of California, on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations throughout the West, invites you to Let George Do It. Till Death Do Us Part, another adventure of George Valentine. Personal notice, change is my stock and trade. If it's loaded with dynamite and has to be kept confidential, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. Dear Mr. Valentine, enough violence has happened in my house to convince me that my sister, a plain scatterbrained spinster of 42, should never have married a man so ruthless, so charming, and so much younger than she is. It could have only been for her money, money that can never be his until she dies. Of all things, this great charmer, Cliff Lavar, is a former ballroom dancer, all of 30. I want you to look into his past. Then we can go on from there. Respectfully yours, Miss Lydia Tarbell, Beach Cove. Come on, Max, come on. Miss Brooks and I have to make a train out to Beach Cove tonight. Now, take it easy, Georgie. I'm a theatrical agent, not a magician. Well, what did you find out about LeVar? All day I've been picking up information on this LeVar character. My secretary's got right as cramp, and she's still blushing. Your secretary, Max? Huh? Oh, yeah, who am I kidding? Who's got a secretary? But there was That's a time okay, when... friends. I... You don't have to put a production to get a fee out of me. It'll be the usual sawbuck. And don't think it ain't worth it. Long-distance calls, telegrams, underworld characters are charging arm and a leg just to say hello. All that I went through. Max. Oh, yeah, who am I kidding? So I went down to the lobby, made a telephone call for a nickel. <laughs> okay, now we're through with the build-up, Max. Let's have it. Well, Georgie... A Fred Astaire, this Cliff LeVar never was. Uh-huh. But uh, maybe it was because the women were after him so much he couldn't keep his mind on his feet. Oh, a lady killer, huh? Anything mm-hmm. more specific? Only that he was married a couple years ago. What? Yeah, but only for 24 hours. Then the girl's papa paid him off. A perfect little gentleman he ain't, Georgie. Very interesting, Maxie, very interesting. Let me have the rest of the hieroglyphics you got on the back of that envelope. Yeah, but... Here's your dough, Max. Mm, I'll put it right in the office safe. Who am I kidding? Who's got a safe? Well, <laughs> I'll just put it in my pocket. Thanks, Georgie. Well, Brooksy, I think just what we have here will be enough for Lydia Tarbell. But as she says herself, let's see where we go from there. Beach Cove, folks. Beach Cove. Well, this is it. Come on, Angel. Okay. Gosh, I hope we can find a cab, George. Can't see a thing in this fog. Oh, yeah. All aboard. You stay here, Brooksy. I'll talk to the station master. Okay, but hurry up. This fog isn't making my cold any better. Wait a minute, you. Huh? You're a Valentine, aren't you? Oh, oh, now, shucks. I thought this was one time I wouldn't have to give out autographs. What did you say your name was, Junior? Get out of here, both of you. There's another train back to the city in an hour. You know, I'm sure the Beach Cove Chamber of Commerce isn't going to like this. What do I have to do to convince you people I'm not being funny? Valentine, stay out of my life. I'm warning you. If you come between me and Edie, I'll kill you. A man and his wife should be left alone. Now, that's a nice, brave speech, Clifford. But you'd better get out of my way. I have an appointment with Miss Tarbell. I told you what you'd better do. George! Hey, look, Najinsky, how would you like an overnight bag right in your face? Put that down, lady. Ouch! Hey, let go of her, Lavar. Valentine, I've been reduced to eavesdropping. I know why Lydia wants you here. She's got this crazy idea that I want to kill Edie, but I'm telling you... I told you to let go of her. Uh, You would have done better if you brought your dancing shoes along, Buster. I could take care of myself. Everybody thinks I'm just a pretty boy. A pushover. I can take you any time. Well, okay. Don't hit him again, George. I... I was mad enough to kill you, Valentine. But that wouldn't have done any good. I realize that now. Just don't make me do anything foolish. (laughs) 
This is it, mister. The Tarbell place up there on the hill. Okay, thanks. Come on, Ferguson. Gee, but I can't see anything. Where are we? You'll find it, miss. It's the only house around. I'll take you up there, but there ain't no road. There's just steps. You did fine, friend. Yeah, when you need me, call Main 486. I'm the only cab around here. It's this uh-huh. way. I've been waiting for you long enough. Uh-huh. Well, where did you come from? Just follow my flashlight up the hill, or you'll break your necks. Well, this is hardly a cheerful welcome. And would you be calling this a cheerful house? You ought to know. You know why you're here. Don't tell me you've been eavesdropping, too. You're talking about Mr. LeVar, aren't you? I've seen what you've done to him, Mr. Valentine. Must have been a mighty big poke you gave him in the face. Too bad I can't stop and congratulate you. Say, who are you anyway? Me? My mother said I was a descendant of the kings, a prince of the earth. The one and only Damien Michael O'Flaherty. Hey, presently a servant. Eh, watch your step taking this turn here. I can see we're coming to the house. What's that light down there in the bay? That would be the pride and joy of the Tarbell sisters. Their cabin crews are... There ain't a Sunday goes by that don't see them out in the bay in it. You don't seem to approve. Me? No. I don't like hard, cold things that make boats run. I'm a stableman. That's why their father brought me here from Ireland as a boy. Uh-huh. Well, let's keep moving, Buster. Horses. Living, glorious things that quell or rile up against you under your very touch. Sensitive creatures. Like Miss Edie. What was that, Damien? Yes, Miss Edie. She's never been free to live her own life, to love and to breathe as she pleases. And now you're here to make things even worse for her, aren't you? Hey, look, Damien, take that flashlight out of my eyes. I met one pugnacious character in the night, and that's enough. I'm just telling you. Don't do anything to hurt Miss Edie, or you'll have me to account to. I'll remember that. And remember this, too. You won't find me coming home like a cringing dog with his face half beaten in. Come on. Oh! What was that? Miss Edie! Was that you? Miss Edie! Hey, we'd better keep up with this, Brooksy. Yeah. Come on. It's all right, Damien. I'm not hurt. You can go back to your place now. Just as you say, Miss Lydia. Good night. Miss Darvell. Yes, Mr. Valentine. This is Miss Brooks. How do you do? You really must forgive me. I'm not used to cement flower boxes falling and missing me by inches. Lydia! Lydia, what happened? I was just behind you coming downstairs and suddenly... Oh! You... You were almost killed. How observant, Edie. But now you go inside. I want to talk to these people. Uh, just a minute, Mrs. LeVar. Did you see your husband since he came home? What? Oh, yes, he... He wasn't feeling very well. That we know, Mrs. LeVar. So he went upstairs to his bedroom. Now, look, I don't want to pry, but... Would his bedroom happen to face the balcony where this flower box was? Yes, that's right. But what are you trying to say? Cliff would never do anything like that. That's what you're all thinking. I know it. Edie, stop this. Stop it this minute. You hate Cliff, Lydia. That's why you hired this man to spy on him. Why, Lydia, why are you doing this to me? Because I love you. I want you to be honest with yourself. Admit there's only one person in the house who could have done this. And it wasn't meant for me, Edie. It was meant for you. Cliff's good and kind, and he really loves me. But you you won't believe that. I hate you. Mrs. LeVar, please. I think your sister is right. Let's go inside. No, take your hands off me. I've got to tell her now just how I feel. Let go of her, Brooksy. Maybe it's best if this whole thing comes out in the open. I don't mind speaking my mind. Oh, yes, it's always your mind. You're the one to say what's to be done with father's money. But when you die, your half goes to your husband. Cliff knows that. It's the only thing he wants from you, your money. Tell Mr. Valentine whatever you want. But Cliff married me because he really wanted me. Nobody ever felt that way about you. Edie. That's why you're doing this to me. You're jealous. Mr. Valentine, 
There were two other near accidents like the one you've just seen. You did say in your ad that if a situation is loaded with dynamite, it's your kind of a job. Oh, Brooksy, I told you to use restraint when you write those ads. Well, when I mentioned dynamite, I didn't think everyone was going to walk around with matches. Well, Mr. Valentine? Well, you know, Mr. Bell, I've already walked into so much tonight, I, I don't think I could force myself to walk out. We'll return to tonight's adventure of George Valentine in just a moment. Meanwhile, a word about protection. Suppose you were the sheriff of Yuba County, California. You'd probably put your car at the head of your list of important equipment. You'd find you have a lot of miles to travel every day and sometimes mighty fast. What kind of protection would you give your car's engine? Why, sure, RPM motor oil. For that's exactly the motor oil that Sheriff John R. Dower of Yuba County uses. And here's what Sheriff Dower says, quote, In my business, I do a terrific amount of driving, and I have to depend upon my car. I use RPM because it lubricates thoroughly, gives longer mileage, and low-cost operation, unquote. So, to really protect your car's expensive engine and to get longer mileage, why not switch to RPM motor oil? Special compounds in this premium quality oil keep your engine cleaner Protect it from internal rust, carbon, lacquer, and corrosion. It adds up to longer car life with fewer repair bills. Better take a few minutes tomorrow for an oil drain and refill with RPM motor oil. Get RPM at standard stations and independent Chevron gas stations where they say and mean we take better care of your car. <laughs> Now back to tonight's adventure of George Valentine. A charming man of 30 marries a wealthy woman a dozen years his senior. Her sister says he's a fortune hunter, and because you're in a business like George Valentine's, you're hired to find out if it's true. More specifically, you must learn whether the near accidents which almost caused Edie's death were accidents or the work of her ever-loving groom. All of which leaves you in the dim-lit hall of a gloomy house, the rain beating on the roof, and the fog rolling up from the bay. It's the right accompaniment for what your client has to say. You can't blame me for being afraid for Edie. You can see that the man is capable of murder. Sorry, I can't be as quick a judge of character, Miss Tarbell. Suppose we talk all this over in the morning. Well, I think that would be best. Perhaps. I may be a little over-emotional about this. Miss Brooks, your room is right there down the hall. Thank you. And uh, yours, Mr. Valentine, is directly across the hall. Uh, just one moment, Miss Tarbell. Yes? Let me get one thing straight. You said that as long as Edie is alive, you and only you have control of the family money. Just what did you mean? Exactly that. But when Edie dies, her half of the money would go to her husband or her children, if any. Yes, Miss Tarbell. Isn't that rather unusual? What's so unusual about giving me, the older sister, the right to exert her better judgment? Unusual? I think not. I'm... I'm sorry. If I thought Cliff was the right man for Edie, I'd gladly give her half of the estate. But frankly, Mr. Valentine, with this report you brought me, do you think he is the right man? Good night. Good night. See you in the morning. Oh, that boat ride you promised us tomorrow. <coughs> I doubt if we're going to have the right kind of weather. Edie and I haven't missed a Sunday morning on the boat for years. Good night again. George, hold me close a minute. Oh, hey, hey now. What's this all about, Angel? Well, I don't know. Maybe it's just the house. It seems so full of hatred. And the fog and the rain outside. Oh, no, look, honey, I'll be right across the hall here. There's nothing to worry about. Okay. Oh, what sleep have I done here. with my life? Forty years gone. George. No, happy. That's easy. Yeah. Hey, look, Angel, go in to see her. Try to calm her down. Find out what's wrong with her now. Okay, but where are you going? Just down the hall. I think it's about time Clifford was in the mood for a little conversation piece with his Uncle George. Can't you see I'm packing, Valentine? I'm getting out of here. Nice shirt you have here, Cliff. Monograms, too. Give me that. Okay, Buster, take it easy. 
Whether you believe it or not, I'm here just to sort of help. How can you change a woman like Lydia? She only believes one thing of me, and that's all. Did you have anything to do with those accidents? No. That flower box tonight? No. You think anything else of me, but I don't go around trying to kill people. I've got to make a train. I gather you've already told Edie. That's why she's there sobbing in her room. She brought this all on herself. She's willing to let Lydia run her life. For me, I can live in a furnished room, be a short order cook. Uh-huh. Aren't you forgetting something, bud? Lydia and her money. She doesn't trust banks, so she has all that cash, negotiable securities, jewels right here in the house. All right, so she's eccentric. But I still want to talk to you. Lydia's afraid I'll go skulking from room to room, ripping up mattresses, digging up the cellar to find the family fortune. But she doesn't have to worry. I'm on my way. Uh, you, you read that very well. But there's just one little thing you forgot to mention. Get out of my way. That time in Boston, you married a debutante. Get paid off in 24 hours, 25 grand for an annulment. You don't miss a thing, do you, Valentine? Would it help you very much to know I also played hooky from school once? How much do you expect to get from the Edie deal? Nothing. I love Edie. You know what it means to a man who spent his life taking from other people to, to find someone who really needs him? All I have to do is to say her name quietly and her eyes light up. She's happy. Actually beautiful. And you know something? It makes me happy. Happier than I've ever been in my life. You know, I'm almost inclined to believe you. Look, do me a favor, Cliff. What's that? Be around for tomorrow. Lydia's got her heart set on that boat ride. I want you to be along. Is that a request or something I have to do because you know I have a glass jaw? Okay, think of it any way you want. But I hope to see you in the morning. Hey, wait a minute. Before you go, Valentine. Yeah? That 25 grand you were talking about. I didn't even keep it overnight. I bet it on the worst horse at the track. Very careless, sir. No, I didn't want that kind of money. Money a father's willing to pay because he doesn't think a man's good enough for a decent girl. Have a good night's rest, Cliff. I gotta go now. If I stay, I might even begin to like you. I... Oh, well, well I... Why are you so startled, Miss Tarbell? You've got the right to walk up and down the halls of your own house and listen at keyholes. I don't have the slightest intention of apologizing. Well, I'll tell you the truth. I'm glad you heard what Cliff had to say. I'd like to see what you're going to make of it. Edie, I was just trying to talk to you. No. I've got to tell Lydia how I feel. If I don't do it tonight, she'll have me under her thumb again tomorrow. Hold on, Edie. But I... Just, uh, just what did you have to say, Edie? He's leaving me because of you. You made this thing happen. You've been out in the rain. And you're hysterical. Yes, I was out in the rain. Walking around, trying to think about my own life for a change. Oh, come on back to your room, Edie. You've got to get into bed. We'll talk about everything tomorrow on the boat. How can you talk about boat trips when you've just destroyed the one thing that means more to me than life itself? <laughs> Maybe after tomorrow, things will be different. Now, good night, dear. This is the first time you've kissed me since I married, Cliff. Oh, see? Yeah, yeah. Come on, Edie. But that kiss isn't going to make up for everything you've done to me. You're planning something right now. I know you. This is an unholy way for two sisters to be acting toward each other. What are you doing here? Making your rounds, Damien. I saw the lights were blazing. That's no more than a good servant should do but to inquire. Very loyal of you. But there's nothing you can do. Maybe not. But even a servant has the right to speak his mind once in a while, Miss Lydia. Now, look, why don't you get going, friend? Can't you see you're not helping anyone? What makes you think you can put your hands on me, Valentine? I've got something to say, and I'm going to say it. Very well, Damien. Go on. I know I don't look it. But I hate any kind of suffering and pain. Hate it so much that I can even bring myself to put a bullet through a horse's head when I know there's no hope for it. Come on, get to the point. I mean, to spare pain to anyone I love. I can be a brutal man. I hope that's clear. To everyone. anybody else, but is it kind of cold? And the fish aren't biting. 
<laughs> Patience, Brooks. He almost snagged a seagull that time. I don't know why I'm here at all. Oh. If it weren't for you, Valentine, right now I'd be on my way to... Oh, please, Cliff. Lydia always gets what she wants. You make me out a horrible creature, Edie. It's almost a shame that this may be one of the mornings that I won't live up to my reputation. Isn't that so, Mr. Valentine? <laughs> well, I won't argue with you, Miss Tarbell. Not this morning. Not after the talk we had last night. I think you can find the right answers for yourself. I'd be more intrigued with all this vague conversation if I could catch just one little teensy sardine instead of pneumonia. If everyone will excuse me, there's something I have to do in the cabin. Something that may make the sun come out before we return to shore. Edie, where are you going? This means everything to us, Cliff. I've got to know what she's up to. Hey, take it easy, Cliff. Sit down. <laughs> Isn't it a little too optimistic to be fishing without any bait on your hook? What? Oh. I read somewhere sharks bite at anything. What's the matter? Are the ones around here cowards? There's only one shark on this boat. If I weren't a man who knew how to keep his place, I'd be very happy to be more specific. Coffee. Oh, thank you. Well, you're a man of many moods, Damien. You seem to be much calmer this morning. I just wouldn't want anyone to catch his death of cold on a pleasure ride like this. There's no use trying to talk to her. She ordered me out of the cabin as though I were dead, and I... Now, now, you sit down here, Miss Edie. I'll put this coat around you so you'll be nice and warm. You don't have to do that. I can take care of Edie. I never doubted that for a moment. What was that? George! The gasoline in the engine room must have exploded. Lydia! She's back there. Lydia! Lydia! Don't be a fool, Lydia. You can't go in there. Come on. Give me a hand with this dinghy. Come on, man. Work fast. Stop it, George. Stop it. Edie, don't go in there. Can't you see what'll happen to you? She's in there. I've got to save Nobody her. Nobody can save her. Nobody can get through those flames. Let go of me. That fancy little extinguisher on the wall is going to help. Give it to me. No, no, no. I'm doing all I can. Why don't the flames go down? It's too late, I tell you. The flames are getting worse. Come on, we're getting out of here. If I have to carry you, give me that extinguisher. But you don't understand. Shut up. Hurry, Valentine. I've got the dinghy ready to take us off. Hurry. Your wife all right, Mr. LeVar? Considering what you went through, Sheriff, I'd say so. Ah, uh, it was a terrible accident. Miss Lydia was such a fine woman. Uh, if it's not too much to be asking, I'd like to go in and talk to Miss Edie. She's not seeing anybody, Damien. Sheriff, did Mr. Valentine say where he was going? He said he'd be... Oh, here he is. George, what kept you so long? Oh, things and stuff. I was just leaving, Valentine. Before you do, Sheriff, I wonder if you'd mind coming along while I talk to Mrs. LeVar a minute. Sure thing. Why not? You too, Brooksy. I don't think Edie should be bothered at a time like this. You just wait here with Damien, Cliff. Why did I have to quarrel with her just before it happened? We didn't really hate each other. Poor Lydia. Yes, poor Lydia. It wasn't an accident, Edie. She was murdered. What's that? What do you mean, Mr. Valentine? George, what did you find out when you went back to town? You can imagine what I might have found, Edie, can't you? Me? I had the fluid in that fire extinguisher analyzed. You know, Edie, the one you used trying to save your sister. What about it, George? Yes. What are you driving at? Edie, when you went out in all that wind and rain last night, it wasn't just for soul-searching... You fixed the engine so there was bound to be an explosion. No. And you also put stuff in that extinguisher to make the fire that much worse. No, no, I... You not only wanted to make sure that you did a perfect job, but you also wanted to come out of it as the noble, self-sacrificing sister. Oh, was it wrong for me to fall in love with a man? I won't even attempt to answer that, Edie. But I do know when I've been floored by an incredible piece of irony. I? Irony? Yeah. All the things you did, Edie, you did for nothing. What? what do you say? What do you mean? Well, I've got to admit, I don't know what you're talking about, Mr. Valentine. After everybody went to bed last night, Lydia told me what she decided to do. She brought all the money, the bonds, the jewels down to the boat this morning. What, what did you say? Yes, Edie, she was going to divide it with you at last, so you could be free to enjoy your life with Cliff. That's what she meant when she said she'd make the sun come out before we returned to shore. Oh, what did I do? What did I do? <laughs> you just made sure that the very thing you committed murder for is a heap of ashes on the bottom of the ocean. <laughs> Oh, 
Whew. Oh, I'll sure be glad to get back to, to town, George. Hey, I can hardly see you in this fog. Yeah. Well, at least the train seems to be on time. You know, I could never quite make myself believe Cliff really loved Edie. Oh, but he did, Brooks. He did. And when Lydia overheard what he said to me in his room last night, well, that convinced her. Golly. When you think of it, all those accidents. Uh-huh. It was Edie who made them happen, and it was Lydia who was in danger. Well, that's what struck me right from the beginning. Whenever things happened, both sisters were around. I asked myself, why take it for granted Edie was meant to be the victim? Darling, I'm going to love being the mother of quiz kids. <laughs> you know, I think I'm going to kiss you. In fact, I made up my mind. Why, Brooks? Yeah, it's lucky you're smoking a cigarette or I wouldn't be able to see you. Oh, darling. Well, gee, thanks, lady. Huh? That was swell. Uh, too bad I got to catch a train. What? Well, I meant to tell you, Angel, I wasn't smoking. If your car starts reasonably quickly, if it doesn't stall in traffic or drag too much on hills, you can claim it gives you good performance. But to get command performance out of your car, get Chevron Supreme gasoline. Special blending agents in this high-octane gasoline command fast starts every time you use the starter. Command smooth acceleration, speedy pickup. Command the extra power that makes your car great on hills. And with Chevron Supreme in the tank, you can be sure of command performance from your car wherever you drive. For this premium quality fuel is climate-tailored, specially adapted to each different altitude zone and temperature. Try a tank full tomorrow. You like the command performance Chevron Supreme puts in your car. Ask for Chevron Supreme at independent Chevron gas stations and at standard stations where they say and mean we take better care of your car. Next week, at this time, when you join us in George Valentine's office, you'll hear him say... No, I'm not trying to put anything over on you, Lieutenant. There's no dagger in Forrester's chest. Of course there isn't, George. But one of us killed him. What? Oh, now, look. One practical joke is enough. This is no joke, Brooksy. But Forrester was alive a minute ago when Lieutenant Riley examined it. The fact remains. Right now, he's very much dead. Tonight's adventure of George Valentine has been brought to you by Standard of California on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and Standard stations throughout the West. Let George Do It stars Robert Bailey as George with Francis Robinson as Brooksy. Tonight's story was written by David Victor and Herbert Little Jr. and directed by Don Clark. Also heard in the cast were Georgia Backus as Lydia, Doreen Tuttle as Edie, Harry Bartell as Cliff, Bob Dryden as Damien, Jack Prussian as Max and Victor Rodman is the sheriff. The music is composed and presented by Eddie Dunstetter, your announcer, John Heaston. Listen again next week, same time, same station, to Let George Do It. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System.